Uh, thank you so much, Gary and ULN, for having all of us here at Mobile Me. I truly think this is one of the best Mobile Me conferences we've had yet. I just cannot wait to get back to my teams at CNN and talk about everything I've learned. So, so thank you to everyone for that. Um, a point of clarity, programming. This is not a session about computer programming. So if you thought I was gonna teach you how to code HTML, CSS, JS super fast, you are sadly mistaken. Um, but after this, if you wanna learn how to code, I can show you how to shamelessly copy and paste stuff from Stack Overflow forums. Um, those can actually take you a really long way, surprisingly. If you know, you know. Um, so I wanna talk about programming at the speed of now, which is really about relevance and timeliness, uh, especially in this environment where news is so competitive. As you've heard from a lot of speakers, a lot of that has been enabled by technology where uh, folks with 5G connections, 4G connections, mobile phones in their pockets have become journalists um, in one way or another, whether knowingly or accidentally. Um, and, and so breaking news, which is what CNN does, is competing with all of the other information that's coming out online um, in real time. So I wanna talk a bit about programming um, which is a word kind of borrowed from TV and radio, so uh, more like that wheel um, that Miss Nettles was showing us earlier about filling up information and programming throughout the day, um, and, and talk about how to generate interest from audiences in your content. Um, and that's really what programming is all about, right? So we can create new, interactive, awesome VR, um, you know, text articles, video all day, but if folks aren't there to read it, or if we don't have an audience to consume that content, um, you know, then it's not gonna get the return that we had hoped. So um, I hope that through this presentation, I can at least impart um, some ideas on how you can create feedback loops within your own organization, no matter the size, um, to have a programming mindset. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name's Zach Wade. I'm a senior uh, global programming producer. Um, I've been at CNN for about nine years. Um, this is a photo of me. Uh, if, if you think my eyes look tired, it's because they are. This is at 3 a.m. Um, in the main newsroom in Atlanta at the headquarters on election night um, 2020. So I call it election night number one, because as you know, um, those went on and on and on. and. Um, I, I took the photo because I wanted to just capture the historic nature with the mask and like look back on it and be like, wow, what a time. What I should have done with this photo is actually turn the camera around and had the newsroom in the background instead of that wall because the newsroom was entirely empty um, because of the pandemic. Uh, and there was me and about four other, we called ourselves jokingly designated survivors that night, uh, you know, just running the newsroom um, totally spaced out, like admittedly, I like got up out of my chair and like went over and leaned over someone, even though I wasn't supposed to, like as we were talking, it was like, why are we even spaced out when we're doing that? But um, anyway, uh, it, it, it was quite a time, still remains uh, quite a time um, in, in our news environment, even after the pandemic. Um, so everything I'm talking about really is through the lens of um, complications and obstacles to our own um, climate, our world, um, and, and all the things we're facing today. Um, so CNN is obviously known for a few things. Like these are some of the things that define us and probably come to mind. Award-winning journalism, news you can trust. So really that brand affinity around like, I, I kind of want it straightforward news, right? Like I, I want to hear all sides of an angle um, or a story. Um, and so people come to CNN for that. Ubiquity. Um, you know, we have global reach like uh, no other outlet um, has uh, with reporters on the ground uh, across multiple countries and, and many, many of them. Um, and then a large audience, of course, around, around the world. Um, premium video, um, unlike a lot of legacy news organizations, CNN has a giant TV station that pumps out video all the time, right? So uh, we figured out ways to um, make uh, uh, use cases for our users on digital for that video. Um, we're mobile first and we're very data driven and those two po last two points are the things that I really wanna talk about more. Um, of course, we are massive. We are the largest English speaking news audience on earth. Um, last year, every single month of the year, we had at least 120 million unique visitors 
come to our platforms. Um, so, you know, that's a lot. And I think it speaks to, um, you know, the brand recognition for breaking news. Uh, oftentimes we call it a Pavlovian response when breaking news happens. Uh, we see massive traffic coming into our sites and so um, around 4,000 people worldwide support that and on digital that's around 200 articles and video published daily. So speaking about stress, the programming team has to figure out how do we actually get 200 you know, pieces of content consumed um, and then what kinds of content should we actually produce. Um, this is just a chart that shows CNN's the red line, um, Comscore numbers, uh, and um, we have been the news leader for a while. Um, although now we are sort of duking it out with the New York Times um, for number one. And um, has anyone played Wordle on their phone? Okay, pretty much everyone, which is kind of the answer I expect. New York Times bought Wordle, and um, and is part of the reason why they're doing so well with <laughs> their monthly numbers. Um, so big plus one to mobile gaming and the power of that for you know, a business model. Um, uh, this chart just shows how um, our growth over time has been fueled by mobile. This is particularly mobile web traffic and we're the red line. Um, so you know, big, big audience, but size is not really the reason for our success. Um, and I think we're actually pretty successful um, despite our first mover advantage um, in the marketplace and our giant brand affinity. Um, we are nimble and quick. So specifically seen in digital is investing in constant optimization and constant pivoting of our content strategy to keep up with the new cycles. Um, we're doing lots of experimentation, testing with content, um, audience research, um, and formulating an overall content strategy that is fairly flexible. Um, all of that investment is really um, around what we call global programming. We have a global programming team um, of which I'm on. Um, with folks based in Atlanta, New York, and London, and others distributed across the nation. Um, and uh, our sole job is to figure out how can we generate interest in our content? What kind of smart maneuvers can we make um, with our giant distribution channels and all of the possible stories we might write to actually create stuff that will resonate with people? Um, so I am obsessed with this show, Industry. I don't know if anybody's seen it on HBO, um, but this character, her name is Harper Stern. She's super smart. She's constantly listening to like real-time analytics and making financial moves and stuff. And there's a, there's a scene in this um, show that really resonates with me. She's sort of dealing with this high-flying, eccentric billionaire type. And he tells her, you know, don't tell me which way the wind is blowing or, or how the markets are moving. I already know that. Tell me how to blow it. Tell me how to actually make the needle move. Um, and so that resonated with me because that's exactly what global programming at CNN is attempting to do. We can monitor real-time analytics and what our audience is up to all day long, but we have to figure out what are the actionable intelligence and levers we can pull across our sites and content that would actually uh, be greater than the sum of the parts that we're putting into it. Um, so if I could be like Harper Stern when I grow up, that would be awesome. Um, one way to think about programming as well, just the functions. Um, we have a feedback and planning team that's specifically designed for capturing best practices and uh, making sure they're communicated, communicated across the newsroom. Our whole global programming team, including the planning and feedback team, is doing tons of testing all the time, and I'm going to get into specific examples of that. But um, uh, the planning, testing, and feedback functions of our team are roughly similar to what some of you may be familiar with, um, the build, measure, learn feedback loop. Um, uh, the Lean Startup um, was a big evangelist of that concept, and a lot of product organizations uh, use build, measure, learn. Um, but the idea is if we're able to do all three of these things in really tight cycles really quickly, then we're going to be able to respond to changes in the business or the news cycle or our audience tastes and affinities fairly quickly. So why do we value speed in particular? Um, there's several reasons. The three main ones are we are breaking news brand to be competitive uh, with our competitors. We need to have news out fast. So that's very basic. Um, the new technology, as I mentioned, uh, is creating even uh, greater necessity for that and just audience demands us to be quick. 
Uh, we only have about um, 32 seconds on our pages to actually capture interest. Um, but uh, you know, we've ha we have a ton of people coming in for breaking news. And if you can just think about the last 30 to 40 days, um, we've had a ton of it. You know, Hurricane Ian, uh, Fiona, uh, Putin's mobilization, all the twists and turns in the Ukraine war, and then, um, of course, uh, Queen Elizabeth's death, which, um, you know, this was a huge day, really two days for us and a whole week. Um, uh, and this is really representative of the, the Pavlovian response. People know to come to CNN um, on air and on digital when these big worldwide events happen. So this is a layout uh, our team created um, that's full bleed photo across the desktop. And um, this, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty stunning visually. It takes a lot of work to plan for. Um, so our planning teams are thinking about the assets and the right photos to use and um, how we're gonna staff our uh, asynchronously updating timeline module and how do all those pieces come together. Um, I actually, for at least four hours, um, on this day was literally programming a separate site in case we wanted to draw back into a normal layout um, with all the content that we would need for that sort of concurrently so that we could just flip the switch to do it. So um, lots of pieces uh, go into this, but you know, I think um, w when you have that flexibility of layout and you're able to signal the audience that something's super important at the time, it, uh, it, it does truly pay off. So as I mentioned, 32 seconds um, on the home pages to really capture interest. That's the average time uh, someone spends on our home pages. Not very long. Um, and, and that's actually probably our most generous audience. That's our brand-led audience. People who are typing in CNN.com or going through a shortcut uh, to our home pages. Um, and, and those are our most brand-loyal folks, right? So um, we have even less time um, for our side door audience coming straight to article. Uh, we have even less time to capture interest um, for folks coming from social. Um, so it is super competitive that we, uh, and super necessary that we remain competitive with speed. Um, so one example is the sort of like game of inches we play with push notifications. Um, this is just a breaking news story, um, a phone screen with several alerts uh, uh, when Letitia James was uh, filing a, a lawsuit against um, Trump and the organization. Uh, where you really want to be when you're looking at this, and not obviously real users aren't going to have every single news app on their phone, right? Like we're all sort of like hyper super users. Um, but you really want to be at the bottom um, because if you're at the bottom of this uh, totem, you were the first to alert it. So in this case, um, we were. Uh, in, in, in times of big news, uh, you know, being first is, is paramount on push notifications because you know, if it's on your phone and you're interested in that, you're going to go to that alert and anything that comes in after that, you know, uh, you're not necessarily going to pay attention to. So um, a specific example, um, it really where the planning function of our team aligned really well to um, kind of be a force multiplier with breaking news um, was when um, Coolio died a few weeks ago, uh, the 90s rapper. And um, we were one of the first to send out our alert in our social um, language. And uh, we noticed a really interesting pattern that we hadn't seen for a lot of other obits. And that was that, um, and this was during hurricane coverage, um, by the way. So the story really broke through with audience and was like the number three story um, the day it happened and, and the day after. Um, still really, really strong. And our uh, planning team had, of course, prepped the obit, had the right slug that would be, you know, uh, with his name in it and the headline with his name at the top, um, so that search would capture it. Um, but we took a lot of effort to make sure that all of our alert language and, and homepage language was ready to go in our entertainment Slack channel so that as soon as we got the news, you know, we could be out first. So. Um, just to show you why that's important for audience growth, uh, this chart here shows when search spiked on Google um, uh, at around 9 o'clock. And then uh, we were short to publish about 20 minutes after that, which actually for, you know, we didn't beat like 
people's Twitter accounts, right? Um, which is its own issue. But um, we beat all the major players, and because we were first, um, we got to benefit from this really long tail um, for two whole days uh, on, on high search ranking and um, search traffic. So, um, you know, this was a, a great success and, you know, really showed how we could tell audiences this story um, through uh, having prepped and planned for it and, and really in a matter of minutes and really that first 30 minute crucial window on search um, made a difference. So this is just showing how actually almost 60% of our audience came from um, search throughout the lifetime of, of this uh, Coolio obit. And, um, and as you know, like if, if audiences coming from search or social, uh, those audiences are most likely to be less brand loyal um, and just interested in the news. And so uh, they're, they're valuable because they're new audience. Um, so the difference between a, a strong day for overall unique visitors on CNN or a weekday on uh, unique visitors for CNN is often um, how much of the side door search and social audience can you attract. So planning was really crucial for that. Um, so and another reason why planning is crucial uh, breaking news at CNN is not a monolithic thing. We've got tons of platforms we do this on. Um, our core platforms are CNN Mobile Web, um, so the Mobile Web uh, homepage on your phone, our apps um, where you actually receive the push notifications, uh, desktop, CNN Go. We have a ton of video platforms. Um, our off-platform and new audiences team manages a ton of social messaging and uh, emerging and, and off-platform audiences. Um, of, of all of these, Apple News is by far our biggest audience. But um, we, we program to them differently. Uh, you know, for the core audience on mobile web, app, and desktop, they have different behaviors and attributes. So we really try to lean into programming for them um, in ways that will resonate with them. We know that our mobile web audience is often a community of strangers, we'll call them. Um, they're sort of one and done. They usually come from the side door social or search, they come to us, they hang around for maybe one article and they bounce. So our big challenge with them is to make sure that we put content in front of them that um, they're more likely to want to read. Um, they, they come for breaking news um, and, and what we do on the homepage for mobile web is really just focused on removing boulders um, to the rabbit holes that they can tumble down. So stories that are performing really well um, particularly those that represent some content diversity that's not the meat and potatoes of, of CNN's breaking news, um, we will surface higher on mobile web in order for it to resonate um, with the audience that might have affinity toward that content. Um, app, these are folks who took the time to search the app store, download the CNN app. Um, they have a high brand affinity. They're super fans. Um, they love an Anderson Cooper eye roll, right? So we'll animate that for days and put it on a video. And, they really have an appreciation for CNN's talent in ways that um, the other platforms um, don't as much. Um, and then on desktop, um, we have all of this space to really figure out how do we want to set the agenda. Um, lots of information hierarchy, like photo size um, uh, differences we can make, layout differences. And so like that Queen Elizabeth layout, the full bleed, um, was one example of like five or six that are go-tos for us to signal you know, this is important. Uh, from a strategic standpoint, um, we're really considering the audience funnel as one of trying to engage users at a deeper level. Um, so, you know, that distribution chart I showed uh, with, you know, all of our messaging platforms and off-platform social, that's really the top of our funnel. That's like the new audience. They're not necessarily coming to homepages as frequently, um, but if we can capture interest there, like with the Coolio, um, uh, obit story, um, then we've got them on CNN, or maybe we can get them to convert to more regular CNN um, homepage users. Um, and then the very sort of narrow aperture of that funnel, if we can really deeply engage them, is to get them to sign up for a newsletter or register with us. Um, that's basically asking them to give us an email, um, which is quite a high bar online, because a lot of folks are very protective of their email. Um, but does enable us to offer them all these other cool things like personalization um, and, of course, our newsletters. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, how we serve a, 
um, a role in, in um, providing news that's super critical to our audience, right? Um, I was actually working uh, this night uh, when the insurrection occurred. Um, we've got a you know an extraordinary site-wide all caps headline. We've actually got a reminder to folks about where things stand with the Electoral College in case anyone's confused um, in the bottom left. Um, and of course, it just screams breaking news, right? Um, that this is super important. Um, we also do a lot to show the context of something. So this was actually shortly after January 6th where we use what we called our Trident layout to really tell three different stories that all sort of ladder up to this theme of democracy at risk. And you know, on the far left is really about this uh, resistance from the GOP to um, go forward with the January 6th commission. Um, in the middle is like the internal conflict bet between uh, groups within the GOP and then misinformation on the right and all of the reasons why that actually kind of sets the foundation for the problems, um, you know, on the other two columns. So, um, you know, we can take a step back on our home pages and really provide that context as well. Um, one of our North Star metrics to improving engagement overall is just generating higher click-through rate. Uh, it sounds really simple, but there's so many different levers you can pull to actually pull this off. Um, if you look at our homepage and you're an editor in our newsroom, um, you'll actually, it looks more like a Christmas tree than a homepage. It's got tons of bubbles with information in it. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with Chartbeat. It's a real-time analytics tool. Um, and this is super helpful to us because we can start to not only try to, you know, position stories to set the news agenda, but now we can actually use real-time analytics to figure out can we place higher performing stories or overperforming stories higher on the page and can we start to place lower performing stories lower on the page so that um, folks have a better chance of actually engaging with our content and reading our content. Um, so this is a super useful tool for us. Um, you can zero in on an individual piece like this um, and see the overall trajectory of its performance, clicks per minute, um, and even its quality clicks, which actually accounts for some bounce rate in there. We can see if we're doing a good job of actually delivering on the promise of the headline and not um, venturing into the territory of clickbait. Um, and a few ways that we use this um, is really uh, overall to increase the overall click-through rate of the homepage, right? So this uh, panel on the left shows um, that we have 22,000, um, almost 23,000 clicks per minute at the time this screenshot was taken. If we're doing our job right as programmers and we're testing headlines and experimenting with placement and choosing really compelling photography, we can increase that click-through rate from 23,000 clicks per minute to 25 or 26. Um, half of our, uh, and this is a typical behavior of audiences on home pages really anywhere, Half of them come to just scan headlines and they don't click on anything, right? So there's really a chance to move the needle um, on home pages by increasing your click-through rate on those surfaces. Um, if you do it just a little bit, you're gonna have a ton more engagement, ton more time spent, ton more page views, um, and that's really exciting because you can see it happening in real time. Um, so this other arm of what we do, testing, um, this number I'm very proud of. Um, this is actually the number of headline tests we conducted last week, 373. Um, it's a lot. Um, each one of those headline tests on our homepage increased click-through rate by 32% on average. So you can start to see how when you do a lot of these and you start to get good at you know, testing different variants and different headline and angles to see what resonates with audience, that you could increase the click-through rate and engagement on your homepages. Um, so this is an example of how one homepage test, um, and we've got many examples, I'll just sort of zero in on this one, um, really changed the trajectory of traffic on this particular Stephen Collinson analysis one morning. Um, our original headline said five days that changed the war in Ukraine, and we experimented with a ton of different variants like we do all the time, and the winner was a new realization dawns for Washington, Europe, Kiev, and Mes Moscow. Um, and that had 140% increase in click-through rate. Um, so it kind of spurred a chain reaction. That story was not doing very well on the homepage before, so it wasn't in a prime position. But after that test, we were able to put it in the lead position um, with that overline that has um, part of the winning headline framing there. Uh, you can see on the right, 
our overall traffic onto that story really bounced after 6 a.m. And, and started going way, way up. Um, we have a monitor bot in Slack set up to show us when there's headline changes on a story. So if there's an update or breaking news, we can see immediately when that happens and, and we know we can reflect that change on the homepage. Well, this is just demonstrating that um, as part of a feedback loop we built with the content teams, uh, they went ahead and changed their homepage headline to the winning one that Global Programming found, or their story level headline, I'm sorry, to the one that Global Programming found. So what, now what that does is anytime someone discovers that story on social or search, they're gonna see the most compelling headline um, and that's gonna generate even more click-through rate. And you can actually see the blue shaded um, part of that graph also rising um, in tandem with the overall yellow, which is the direct traffic from our home pages. So that's side door audience starting to come in now too, and that's actually creating growth. Um, that story ended up being our number three most read story of the day, and number six for overall content consumption time that week, which is basically a measure of overall time spent on a story. Um, and so that would not have happened unless we had run that headline test and all of those uh, dominoes sort of, you know, fell in that way. Um, one other um, thing to note is that the more we do these headline tests, the more we start to realize which angles of a storyline or a topic of coverage really do resonate with audience. Um, we generated a best practice after running a few like these um, to sort of codify that the uh, curiosity gap in headlines for Ukraine and Russia in particular um, that, that highlights a new phase of the uh, war in Ukraine or a new stage um, really overperforms. And so we started doing more of that um, and really created like a meaty nugget um, that we could then share with all of the other teams on um, uh, the, content, the content desks. Um, and so we have a ton of meaty nuggets like this and so many meaty nuggets, in fact, we almost had a, a, a meatball plate full of meaty nuggets. Okay, so this is an inside joke from the reception last night. So I had to put that in there. Thank you, Gary, for laughing. I think I see Ray kind of chuckling too. Where's Julia? Oh no, well, thank goodness this is recorded. I know, okay, well, so anyway, um, so many meaty nuggets around um, best practices and findings, testing, that we realized we can't just hoard all of these meatballs for ourselves on global programming. We actually have to create a feedback mechanism so that all of the desks who are writing stories and creating the initial headlines know about this, uh, know about these findings. Um, so we created a kind of an internal brand called What Works. It's actually a newsletter I write every Monday that goes out to everyone in the network. Um, even our CEO reads it uh, to stay grounded in what's going on in digital. Um, these are just a few example headers on these internal uh, emails that really cover in-depth specific parts of our audience and coverage um, that we do for our audience. Um, so we had one on distinctive weekend content and how folks on the weekend are usually coming for some of our more enterprise storytelling or lean back type of storytelling, entertainment, um, our live storytelling on uh, the war in Ukraine and our curious consumer audience which loves stories like why Costco is still able to charge only $4.99 for chicken and the uh, amid inflation and things. So um, many, many, we've been doing these for about two years every week and it's become sort of this following internally where people are actually anticipating these emails and like can't wait to read them. And even, you know, the folks who operate the TV side of things who don't have access to real-time analytics or some of the more granular things that we're able to test on digital are reading this and finding these meatballs and you know, taking action on the network. So really, really cool. Um, one of the goals of what works is really to try to broaden the definition of news judgment. You know, the traditional definition of news judgment, more or less, is sort of like, is there news value in this particular story, right? Um, what works kind of takes two more layers and, and puts it on top of that, which is, is there newsworthiness and will there be an audience reception? Um, will it resonate with audience? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is we need to do this story because it's, it's important um, and we don't expect a lot of audience, but we should at least make sure we do all we can to get as many folks into that story as we can. So we'll, we'll pull up old angles of previous stories that 
maybe have performed well and say, well, why don't you try tackling it from this side or that? Um, and then resources in the newsroom, right? Um, we're all, we all face constraints, time, budget. Um, so given um, all of those on the balance, is a particular area of coverage or a particular story worth doing? Um, this is just one example of how we looked into climate in particular and in our, in our coverage of climate. Um, climate can sometimes be a, a hard sell because it's sort of this like slow moving disaster, as you know, and the consequences of it, some are facing now, some haven't faced, some will face in the years to come. Um, but we did a really in-depth analysis uh, with the help of our data intelligence team to look at what kind of articles have we produced, what are the general themes of those articles, and then um, where, what, which topics in, as part of climate have overperformed for the amount of articles we've produced and which have underperformed. And so we found that you know, the iterative sort of inside the beltway DC policy angles on climate um, really underperformed. And really it was the stuff around how is it impacting folks on the ground and particularly uh, water scarcity in the West, right? Um, and so uh, using this information, we actually take, take this to the climate desk and start producing stories that had really high resonance. Like um, there's a city named, it's not Las Vegas, Nevada, it's Las Vegas, New Mexico, and it was running low on water and causing all of these um, sort of domino effects uh, for health, public health. And it just soared over the weekend. And we would not have thought to pursue that story if it, if it weren't for the analysis we have done about the success of water scarcity and impact on the ground angles of climate, rather than you know how might the Inflation Reduction Act prevent this kind of thing in the future. Of course, this is also more visceral and, um, and visual, um, but you know really codifying those findings and sharing it widely, what we found has helped um, us uh, you know produce more hits, more home runs. So um, in the feedback loop that we have created, of the what works notes that I just talked about as part of that, we also of course have daily news meetings, um, uh, an overview of the weekend stories people care about because a lot of times that helps us inform what we start to do for the week. And then um, a, a dashboard we call Delilah that's basically what are all the big enterprise storytelling um, offerings that we have at CNN and how do we space them out across the week so that they're not stealing oxygen from each other and uh, really spacing is, is quite important because um, there are things like uh, aggregators like Google, Google News might only want to pick one really distinctive enterprise story um, to put in their discover feeds um, a day. And so if you have two, you kind of miss out. You'd rather have more days where you have one of those enterprise stories than a, a, a day or two where there's a lot clustered. And so there's a lot of data around that. But we have a ton of ways in which we, the global programming team in particular, um, takes feedback and then you know creates learning out of those. Um, this is just speaking of climate and weather. Um, a few of the findings, like from angles and, and things that particularly resonate with our audience, uh, we created a rule of thumb around for our for our desks. Uh, we call it the three D's of framing for extreme weather: danger, devastation, and delta. And danger is usually sort of in the lead up, um, really leaning on headlines that uh, lean in on the anticipation of the storm. Um, clues into the magnitude. You can see um, a lot of times quotes help with this, something that we haven't seen in our lifetime it was a 284% increase over you know, intensifying in aims for Cuba, right? Um, the scope of damage, oftentimes this is literally just a headline that promises readers um, a full view of how a storm damaged a community. That's often enough um, to, to show that there is damage and here's, here's what you're about to see. And then um, the delta, which is often, you know, the difference, you know, how is this time different? Um, we'll, we'll use superlatives, like is this the strongest, the worst, the deadliest, um, the most life-threatening, um, to really lean in on successful framing. And this particular story did really, really well about um, how the West experienced a massive drought and then a massive downpour um, in short succession and created this really crazy, um, disaster, uh, and so the West experiences what scientists have warned about for years, shows that it's a rare event. Um, warning typically does well in headlines. So these are things that um, we, we've create, created rules of thumb around to help our desk just go out the gate with stories, with the right framing um, that will do well. 
Um, and so uh, just to reiterate, you know, when we share feedback, it's not just to content desks or our own team, it's also to product teams. Um, so uh, this is super important because when we're building products and new story templates and things, we want to bake in the information we know about our audience um, into, um, into what we're building. Um, one really specific example that's very recent um, that we found, uh, the global programming team found in collaboration with the politics team, is that a takeaways piece on um, some of these state, um, state level debates happening now does so much better than publishing even the more labor intensive walk up, rolling coverage, and a uh, summary article. Um, they can be kind of a bulleted approach with like the four takeaways, the five takeaways. That particular framing does even better with audiences on homepage and search, and it's less work for us. So that's kind of like the intersect, the, a beautiful intersection, right? Um, and, uh, and that actually frees up our politics editors to do even more creative reporting elsewhere. So these are just two examples recently that um, we were able to do. And you know, hopefully, you know, with this finding and, and with this feedback loop, we'll do more of this and we'll also um, be able to potentially create templates around uh, a takeaways format where we sort of just bullet approach it now in a regular article template. Maybe there's a specific type of story storytelling format that's conducive to this type of story. Um, So that is um, roughly the, the three major functions of programming in some specific examples. Um, and I just want to leave time for questions, I think. Um, happy to take any. Okay, um, so I'm Haley with the University of Iowa. Um, so you mentioned that pivoting for like what platforms work and what doesn't. Um, so with the failure of CNN Plus, are you trying to find any other program to replace that to um, uh, entice new audiences or uh, even perhaps keep the ones uh, that you still have with you? That's a great question. So um, CNN Plus uh, obviously is no longer, there's a few remnants. Um, who's talking with Chris Wallace was a CNN Plus exclusive show. It's now a um, Sunday um, night program. Um, what we are doing on digital now is really focusing on core platforms. So where um, there was previously some focus on uh, you know an entirely new business model, what we're doubling down on on uh, digital at the moment is a reinvestment in our core platforms. And uh, also, you know, trying to invigorate a super engaged audience. Our North Star metric is something called an engaged unique visitor, which is by definition someone who's come to CNN on digital and not only come to us, but then taken one additional action, like maybe they clicked on a recirculation link in an article to move to another article. Maybe they tapped a video on the article they landed on. Maybe they came to the homepage and clicked on one of those great headlines and read a story. Um, it might seem like a really low bar for interaction, but like I said, a lot of folks are one and done. So having this EUV goal and benchmark that we have helps us figure out new strategies to create more content and more experiences and uh, better UX to get people to just do one more thing with us, right? Um, the overall reason for that is because um, we're going to start, and we have started experimenting um, with registration. You know, a lot of uh, news outlets do this. You know, famously, New York Times, Washington Post, you pay for that. Uh, we're, not, we're not asking for um, anyone's pocket change yet, but we are looking at ways in which we can create a, a value. Um, if you give us an email, what might we provide to you um, that would improve your experience on CNN? So we're testing all of these value proposi propositions. Um, some is uh, friction on content where um, we're testing uh, a modal that pops up about halfway down an article um, that says, hey, uh, register with us, read the rest. Uh, that's probably not gonna be for breaking news articles, but things in their content diversity track that uh, don't have a ready alternative necessarily in the marketplace, but are also um, really engaging. Um, uh, and so that's our focus now. Is, is really to look at how can we make core as compelling as possible and start to deepen our relationships with users and, and create these value propositions where 
they're comfortable um, uh, giving a little more to us about them and we can give them things like personalization um, and machine learning and, and more relevant content. Um, and that's the trade we are focused on making now. Um, so when speed is put at the forefront of production, um, accuracy can occasionally fall. So what has CNN done to sort of mitigate those mistakes falling through the cracks when still maintaining that number one breaking news position? It's such a good question. Um, because oftentimes, you know, it feels like you're, it's t a tug of war between the two. We have to be accurate first. Um, we will be late at the expense of accuracy every time. Um, I think one really good example, just like the so, sort of the benefit of being accurate, obviously you maintain the trust in the brand and you're, you're doing your audience a service. So that's by far the main reason. But um, if you have original reporting and it is accurate um, and, and you're speedy, um, so you kind of have the best of all things, Google also rewards that over an aggregated story um, that maybe you're citing like originally reported by WAPO or whatever. Um, so, we, so the answer is we do a lot of planning ahead. Um, because accuracy, accuracy is so important, we plan every single core um, push notification for any planned event, like maybe it's a, a court ruling of Supreme Court or a crime and justice story. We'll have different scenarios written out with all the subject matter experts approving it far in advance. Um, the global programming team is doing that. Um, so uh, accuracy is by far the most important, but we can be speedy by planning too. Um, and that's just being like super prepared so that the drop of a hat, you can press send on this language, right? And have the right story link and, and all of this. And so it is a game of inches. You know, if we're two minutes behind our competitors, we might miss out on the window of that like search spike and, and not have giant traffic to Coolio um, over two days because Google is like, well, New York Times had it first, you know, we're gonna give them that traffic. So, great, great question. I thought this was a really great presentation, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, I, I was hoping you could expand a little more. You talked about sort of like A-B testing with headlines. So, it, I was interested, is it like you change it on the website directly? Do you work with um, maybe interest groups, think tanks, et cetera, for that kind of thing, or is it, primarily just through changing on the website, getting those live analytics. The beautiful thing about it is it's very scientific. It's done on the fly through Chartbeat's real-time software. And so we can create an A, B, C, D, E, F variant and, and do it in real time. And what happens is certain segment of users will see the A version, another segment will see the B version, another will see the C version. It's so advanced that if one looks like it's starting to win above the others but hasn't reached the statistical significance yet, it'll actually not show the ones that are lower performing to the other audience during the test to create less damage and click-through rate on the story. Um, we use this all the time, not just to increase click-through rate, but also, I, th I think I mentioned maybe, to understand what angles of a story our audiences really wanna know. Because then we can actually go back the next day and say, hey, remember those, all those headline tests we did? Let's approach the story from that angle this time and not try to just like pull out something from the fourth graph. Let's make that the lead. Um, and so that's the kind of feedback loop that gets us in a really positive spin um, and, and you know, grabbing more audience from those home pages. Hi, Wade. How you doing? Good. How are you? Not bad. Uh, I was curious in regards to what you were saying about your takeaways a few slides back where you had one that I think did around 500,000 in views and the other one had like over a million. Yep, there it is. Why, why exactly is one more popular than the other? Is it the wording? Is it just the image? Is it the size, how you present it? I'm curious. All of those are factors. In this particular case, the, the, Georgia, uh, the Georgia debate is by far... Uh, I think more of interest to users than the Ohio Senate debate, just in general as a story. But, um, you know, the programming teams makes decisions that sort of compound that effect. So if, if we know that from the initial state, we probably aren't going to play this in the T1 lead story spot because we just know there's just not as much news energy and audience interest around that. But for the Georgia Senate debate with Warnock and Walker, we, we've already seen you know, within the first 10 minutes of publishing that story, 
chart beat is showing that that's high interest. And so we're gonna go ahead and put that in the lead story position. And that, that snowballs, right? So that's gonna have an impact on SEO. That's kind of an impact with discovery on home pages. And that helps also just create more traffic to it. Yeah, I mean, I think the first is just gut editorial instinct. Um, you know, what are people talking about? What, what are other competitors covering? What's the news agenda? Um, from previous stories, we know Herschel Walker is a really controversial figure. So we go into these situations with a pretty good idea. We're not gonna put that story below the fold. We know it's gonna go high up. Then once the chips are on the board, the difference between what performs and what doesn't perform is fairly um, granular and we can start to sort the chips once they're on the board in a way that makes the most sense for discovery. And it might seem like um, an overkill in terms of massaging placement of stories, but the reason it's not is because scroll depth um, is so low, and this is the case for probably any homepage, that you get to about one-fifth of the way down the scene at homepage, and you've only got about 30% of the audience staying with you. So there's this scroll attrition. And if we had this story lower down, people wouldn't have discovered it. So it's even the case for moving something from here to here, uh, surprisingly. And it's more exaggerated on mobile web. Yeah, I mean, your observation is right. It looks fairly like a newspaper. I think one of the things as we redesign our pages, and we are, by the way, we're moving to a new CMS called Stellar, and with that comes a, a host of improvements to the piping of our website, um, performance-wise, loading and rendering, um, but also um, the layouts. So what we still want to keep are our ability to signal to users, this story is more important than another story, but this one's more popular. So um, you have uh, you know, two different dimensions you're kind of trying to convey. One is, you should read this because others are reading it, and we want you to discover it. Might not be important, it might be about Cardi B or something, um, but this is what's important. Here's a big photo. So there's still gonna be information hierarchy. I think it will be more streamlined because we're gonna be moving to um, potentially more of a one feed um, that serves mobile web, desktop, and app with more personalization to differentiate it rather than manual placement and maneuvering. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all very important um, to consider as we redesign it. The user experience, the what people expect from CNN from a news value. TikTok is hacking dopamine. And um, we've got, news has got to figure out a way to do that too, however that might be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I went through that one pretty quickly. You're welcome to take a photo of it. Um, I think it was over here. Yeah. Fascinating, um, you know, presentation. I loved all the insights that you were sharing, and I, I feel as if you had briefly touched on it. But I'm curious to learn more about your relationship with the product team and the design team, that based on the data that you're getting, and it sounds like you're doing a redesign, how do you come together to decide on, well, we, th we feel this is going to work base, uh, best based on the analytics, but then complementing the design and the product side of things as well? It's a great question. Um, because I think a lot of us face this, um, you know, struggle, I don't think struggle is too strong of a word, um, and, and really, every time we have folks who come in who are experts in technology, but not necessarily journalism, trying to interface with folks who are super editorial, super users, who also just have an understanding of what their audience expects and wants, um, and, and then sort of like meeting in the middle to, to figure out what I call the sliver of opportunity, which is 
where can we satisfy our user needs from a new standpoint and our own internal needs from a new standpoint and the proof is in the pudding with, yes, this did raise overall net page engagement by 6%. Um, those, both of those things have to be true, and I think they can be. It just takes a lot more work. So, um, you know, one specific example, just in the case of the redesign, which, um, you know, I think a lot of designers have a tendency to want to make everything look like Apple's latest, like, product launch, where there's a lot of white space, and there's, like, a ton of cool colors and graphics and um, what works for news is content density. Part of the reason I mentioned the scroll depth attrition, uh, you actually don't have a lot of time or a lot of real estate to actually capture interest. So there's not this habit of scrolling. Now, maybe we can create that with another experience, but as far as having those uh, horizontal lines that kind of create uh, folds on the page, those are natural blocking points. So I'm not saying a Pinterest style staggered layout would work any better, but maybe there's a gold coin at the bottom of the page we could put, for instance, that people just really can't wait to read and that forces them to scroll. That could be one idea. But as, as of now, content density is more important. That, that seems to be, you know, in contrast with what design generally likes to go toward. So those conversations have to, to definitely happen and bear out, and they do. Um, it's, I think it's a matter of education. Um, educate, educate, educate. We're not just a, a website, right? Um, if, you're, if you have anyone's... Um, Worked for local TV. Sometimes the the digital side can seem like the, you know, stepchild of the TV side, and they're like, put it on the website. It's like, well, we have a strategy here. Like, over communicate your strategy on digital. Um, I don't feel that way about CNN. Digital is definitely held held up in high esteem. Um, but I think when it comes to different expertise, you still have to do the education piece. Uh, it's really interesting to see how scientific everything is in terms of the uh, headline choice and click-through and everything. Um, what kind of efforts are there, if any, into, like, at that level of um, like the scientific aspect of it, of understanding how well people are informed and if they understand things better or worse? Like, is that happening? Or, and, and or could it happen? It's... Oh, that is an area I would just love to explore with you, Dan, because that is an amazing question, right? Because, like, it's not just about engagement and a 1998 URL model where they clicked on one more URL path, right? Like, it's not about that. It's about did they get what they needed from us, and are they more educated, able to navigate their world in a way they couldn't before? Um, I think there are some uh, metrics that we use as guardrails today. Um, one is bounce rate. So at the very minimum, we know we're not over-promising something and under-delivering after the click. Um, and so we uphold at least that expectation of a, of a good user experience um, and not do clickbait. So that's like a very basic level. I think what, where we do the audience service is leaning in onto you know, how to be a citizen and how to um, news people can use and making it really interesting. Like our whole misinformation beat to try to you know, battle lies um, uh, is, is super important. Um, so that's sort of a public service, but it's in terms of satisfaction or coming away with a better understanding, I think we've got to look at um, did, did this create a, some sort of action outside of the website? Um, and that's harder to measure, but it seems like we should try. Thank you.